to C sharp as that other programming language. Um, but the question was made was raised um, that exception handling seems more involved in Java, and um, it may be that I'm covering it in more depth, but it's virtually the same in both. And I, I brought up just quickly. How you could, how you could, just as in Java, how you could create your own exception that extends exception, employee list not found, and you could even create different constructors for it, and then you could have if something happened, Well, here they're catching invalid cast, but you could just as well use um, the same thing to catch this custom defined employee list not found. So, again, um, you know, um, the difference between simply catching an exception and catching a specific exception, it all deals with, um, it all deals with if you want to do something different depending on the air. Um, again, you know, the assignments are the assignments to, to help you learn certain things. Um, but the power of being able to throw custom exceptions really comes into play when you really have things that you would handle differently um, if you got this air versus if you got that air. And again, that would depend on the specific program. Um, you know, um, maybe for, a, I'll just give you an example. Um, it could be that a student that has lower than a 2.0 grade point average cannot take more than 18 credit hours. So if they tried to register and go over the 18, it could throw an exception. Now, the GUI could allow for an override based on a password. So you could throw the exception, you could then go and supply credentials or a password and um, then override that in the particular case. All right. Um, as opposed to um, maybe no one, no matter what, can take more than um, 21 credit hours where that's that simply cuts them off and says, nope, you can't take it. The other one, an exception will be handled in a different manner. So again, it all comes down to how you're handling the exception. Um, if you're handling everything simply by popping up a message box, well, you could probably get by just by creating exceptions and throwing them and initializing the exception with the message that you want popped up on the screen. But it's good to know how to throw custom exceptions in that way you can, uh, if you choose to, you can differentiate, differentiate between them and handle them differently. All right, on to the GUI. Um, we're going to take a minute to look at the, the GUI that we looked at last time, and then we're going to look at the new example. And the new example was a little different than I thought last time. I thought they had two, I thought I showed how to do the same thing two different ways. And I sort of did, but, um, I forgot that I had two buttons, so actually both ways were needed in that case. Now normally you would do both buttons method A, both buttons method B, but I did one button method A and one button method B, so just to make it more confusing for everyone. All right, but we'll take a look at that. But first let's go and revisit the, um, the uh, example from last time, because I want to make a specific point with regards to it.
All right, so let's go. If I pass out from the heat, um, yeah, my uh, my wallet's in my pocket. You could my insurance card's probably in there. <laughs> if you find any money in there, you can have it. No credit cards money. Yeah, right, right. There might be credit cards in there, but try using them. <laughs> Jokes on you. It reminds me of the joke of the the person whose credit cards were stolen and. They didn't report it for six months. They said, why? And they said, well, whoever stole it spends less than I do. <laughs> so. All right. So this is what we had last time. And we had um, the ability to convert temperatures from centigrade to Fahrenheit. So if I put in the current temperature in here in centigrade, 70 degrees, that turns out to be 158 Fahrenheit which is accurate based on what I can tell. <laughs> All right. OK, so let's take a look at the code here. Notice that there's only one button. Here's the bit that's critical, I think, for this example. What's critical for this example is this first GUI is serving two roles. All right. It's serving the role of being the GUI, all right, the, the window that's going to pop up, the frame in, in Java swing terms. But it's also serving in the role of an action listener. And when we talk about listeners, what we're talking about is code that responds to user actions. In other words, this code, quote, listens for something to happen, and then based on what happens, goes and does something. So in this case, the real important thing that happens is the user clicks on a button. We want something to go and fire off when the user clicks on the button. So this one class serves both roles. It's going to be displaying the GUI, but it's also going to be listening and reacting to when the button is pressed. And it can do that. It can fill that role because it implements action listener. Remember, one of the ways I, I talked about, you know, we talked about interfaces being sort of a weak ISA. All right. So yeah, uh, a, 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 a bird is a thing with feathers, and a down pillow is a thing with feathers, but that's not normally how we would categorize them. We'd categorize a bird as an animal and a pillow as furnishing or whatever. So this, first and foremost, is a frame. But it serves in the role of an action listener, which means it can do the things, or rather, let me rephrase that, it needs to be able to do the things that an action listener does. All right? Put in more specific programming terms, it needs to have the methods that are defined in the interface action listener. All right? Now, there is only one method that is on an action listener, and that is action performed. All right? Yes, yeah, there, there, this, this would be an event handler. And in fact, in C-sharp what you do, and again, I'm less familiar with desktop C-sharp coding, I'm more familiar with like ASP.NET, but what you would do in, in ASP.NET is you would have your ASP control and you'd associate an on-click event and you'd supply a method, all right? 
So this is sort of doing the same thing. All right. Now, action event E is the argument that gets passed to it. What is E? E is, if you will, the police report about the event that just happened. Now, police report, that's probably too strong of a word. Police report probably makes more sense when we're talking about exceptions, right? Because something went wrong, all right? So there's a report filed, and that report is called the exception object. Performance review. Pardon me? The performance, performance review. review, right. The action event E contains information about what specifically happened. A single action perform method could handle a bunch of different actions. All right. We could actually have five buttons on here and all of them calling this um, action perform method. Well, then we'd have to do something. We'd have to look at the specific event that happened. We'd have to look to see, well, which button was pressed. If it was this button, I'd do one thing. If it was this button, I would do something else. Now, that would not be how I typically would code it, but you could in some cases. In some cases, something like that might make sense. Just think that this action event argument is information about what just happened. The event that caused this action perform method to get called in the first place. And in our case, very simple, it's the button being clicked. So E would have information about like what button got clicked. All right. So in this case, our code is simple. We simply grab the value from the text box do our math, and display the, the results in uh, a label. And we do a try-catch because this could go wrong, right? One of the biggest places for exceptions is, uh, and where exception catching is handled, is number one, if you're referring to something outside of your program's control. For example, if you're doing a database operation, right? A database operation consists of you requesting the database server to do something. You're not doing it yourself. You're asking someone else to do it, right? So you can't rely that they're able to do that, right? Um, database could be down. There could be some error that happened in the database because someone made a mistake in defining tables or whatever. The point is there's nothing I can do in my program to ensure that a database operation works. The best I can hope to do is ask the database to perform it and then be there to clean up any of the messes that result. In other words, handle the exception in a way that makes sense given the exception that's thrown. Same thing here. All right. Um, and, and this is outside the programmer's control because this is user input. And user input, who knows what someone's going to enter, you know. Um, and therefore, probably the most straightforward way to verify that is to try it. If it converts, fine. If it doesn't, then, um, then throw an exception and say that the, there's something invalid about the input. Now, notice what we do. In the role of the window, you know, when we call public static void main, we create our first GUI object. And that goes and sets properties associated with the frame. It makes it visible. It says what to do when you close it. It creates some different stuff on the page adds those things to the page, sets the size, and then opens it up. All right. Essentially what we do is we create a panel, we add our controls to the panel, and then we go ahead and say boom. Set the panel to, set the frames panel to be this panel and then make it a certain size and that causes it to appear. So this is all the frame business here. This is what, this is where we are telling the button 
that this class itself is going to handle when it gets clicked. All right? So in other words, buttons need to know who's going to handle them when they get clicked. So who's handling when this button gets clicked? This is. What is this? It means the very object that we are looking at. Whatever instance of the object we're creating, that is the object that is going to handle when this button gets clicked. Now, this object can do it because this class that the object is being made of implements action listener. So, in other words, it can fill the role. It's legal for it to handle clicks because we've defined it as implementing that interface. And we have correctly um, created the action perform event. So that's what tells it, hey, when you click this button, call action performed, the action perform method associated with this object. All right. Now this is a simple case where you just have one button and you might as well just have your one class serve in both roles, the frame and the um, action, action listener. All right? Serves in both roles. All right? That way you only need one class. The coding in here is simple enough. All right? We're only interested in one user action, clicking the button. So pretty straightforward, we can do that. Now, what would be two things that would break it regards to the action listener interface. How could we break this? How could we generate an error? I know that's probably a weird question. Let me just tell you how we could break this. One way we could break it is we could not say that this implements action listener. How would that break it? It's no longer an action listener, so this statement here would say, this object is not able to handle actions associated with this button. It cannot serve in the role of action listener because it doesn't implement the interface action listener. So in other words, the type of argument that this is here is an action listener. Add action listener is expecting an action listener. And if you don't give it an action listener, it's going to blow up. So that's one thing that could go wrong. You'd be creating another class, and, and that's what we're going to see in the second example, how we're, we're going to create another class. Now, the other thing that would cause us to break is if we did not have this method here. Why would that cause it to break? Well, we promised that this class could handle actions, that it's an action listener. It implements that interface. What does that mean? It means it has all the methods defined in an action listener. Well, what is the method defined in the action listener? The action perform method. So if I did not have the action perform method defined, then the compiler would call me on the fact that this is a lie. This class doesn't implement action listener because it needs to have action performed in order to do that. Oops, that was not right. Wow, that's from my 216 class earlier today. Oh, and I can only go back one undo. Shoot. Don't save. All right, there we go. Back in business. Is that clear to everyone about how the interface works and how this works and how now this class is both the GUI and it's the code that handles the clicking? All right? If that's clear then, then we can forget about this example, right? We can go on to something that will be confusing. And that is, what if we have more than one button? Well, If 
If we had more than one button, if we had more than one button, we could still do it that way. All right, we could. But what would we have to do to make it work? This method would have to be smart enough to know which button got pressed. How would it find out which button got pressed? It would be an attribute of this action event object. Because remember, that's the police report. That's the report of what happened. All right? So included in that report is which button actually got pressed. All right? So we would have to have code in here that would test and say, well, if button A was pressed, then do button A stuff. If button B was pressed, then do button B stuff. And we could do that. I don't think that's a good approach, though. All right? It seems better to me to make up or to create a separate listener that handles one particular thing and just one particular thing. Now, there are cases when you would do that, but not in this particular case. All right? In my Android class, for example, we have a tic-tac-toe game where we have a grid of three by three things on, on a screen. And each one of those little cells on the screen has the same event handler. Because what do you do for all of them? Well, you check to make sure that it hasn't already been selected. If it has been, if it has been selected, then you can't select it again. If it's not been selected, then it's either an X or an O, depending on whose turn it is. All right? So you do that. That would be code I would hate to have to write nine times. Right? So in that case, it was worth it for me to write code to say, all right, which one of these guys actually got clicked? All right? And do these functions, do these operations on the guy that actually got clicked? All right? But in a case like this, I wouldn't recommend doing that. All right? So what do we do instead? We have at least two other options. And we'll open them up. Um, again, remember this is based on how I saved it on the Mac. So I just will open. I do that every single time. So now we can see the whole thing. So if, if you have trouble opening it, try opening it in a different editor than Notepad, like Notepad++ or WordPad or whatever, and then just save it. OK. Notice a couple things before we even look at the code. One Java, but three class files. We've never seen that before, at least not on purpose. All right. Typically in the past, we have had one Java file per class file. So we put each, each class in its own Java file. We compile it. We get a dot .class file. Where you have multiple classes within one Java file, the extra classes are called inner classes because they're a class defined inside another class. All right. When do you do that? You do that when the classes like go together. In fact, can't be seen as separate. Um, and if you think about it, you're not going to have a button handler that's not associated with a button. Just a, I got this button handler floating in space that I'm going to use in my pizza. No one can click on it. It's not on a screen anywhere, right? 
So it doesn't make sense to think of an event handler existing by itself. An event handler always exists as part of a GUI. So event handlers are, are great examples of inner classes. So there's two ways to define an inner class. And we will look at this way first. And then we will look at the second way. All right, so let me compile this and run it. Now we got two buttons. We enter the temperature and we can either say, hey, that's Fahrenheit, or I'm sorry, that's centigrade, we want to convert it to Fahrenheit, or hey, that's Fahrenheit and I want to convert it to centigrade. So let's say 212 degrees Fahrenheit is what centigrade? That's a mistake. I have to look at that. It should be 100. Hmm. Yeah, really? Zero degrees centigrade is 32 degrees, so that part works. Let's say 32 degrees Fahrenheit is 49. See a pattern here. No, no, I don't see a pattern here. Well, we can address that later. All right. Right now, it's calling some code. All right, and it's calling different code than. Um, than what was, uh, what was there. So we have two buttons. The first button, I am creating a new object called C to F, and that object is defined inside my class. So my class, my big class, my GUI class starts here and ends here, all right? So just like you would declare methods, you can declare a class in there. All right? And it's called public class, C to F. Guess what? It implements action listener. Makes sense, right? We're making the whole point of making this class is to handle the first button's clicking. So in order to do that, it has to be defined as an action listener. In order to be defined as an action listener, it needs to implement that interface. And if it implements that interface, what does it need to do? Well, it needs to have the action performed event. And the rest of the code is essentially a copy of what was in the other one. All right? So now I set the action listener of this to a new instance of this. All right. This is kind of shorthand. An alternate way I could do it is I could say Could do that. All right. This one line is the equivalent of these two. The difference between the two is in this case, we don't have any pointer that points to it. All right. Within our GUI code. We've said, hey, create a new one of these objects and use it as the event handler for this button. But we haven't given it a variable name, which means we can't do anything to that class in our code, which is OK, because we really, you define a button handler, you really don't want to do anything to that class in your code. It's not like a customer where you want to change a customer's address or 
let the customer place an order or do something like that. An event handler only exists to handle events. And once you define how that event's handled, you're done with it for the most part. So we really don't need a variable to point to this. So we can do this and say, all right, create a new C to F. You don't need to store the pointer anywhere, but create that object and set that object to be the action listener to the first button. All right. This does the same thing. It creates an instance of the C to F handler. It stores it in this variable. And then it says, OK, set the action listener to this guy, the one that I just created. So in both cases, button convert CF gets set as its action listener and instance of that C to F inner class. Okay. Now, here's an important thing about inner classes. Because it's defined completely within the other class, it can see that other class's variables. So, this inner class can ask for the value of the text box called txt temp. Notice how that's not an attribute of the listener class. That's an attribute of our main frame class. Right here. But because this is an inner class, this guy can access the outer class's variables. Which again, if you're thinking about uh, event handlers, that makes sense, right? You would want an event handler to be able to access the other things that's part of the GUI, right? Because typically when you click on a button in a GUI, you take something from the different controls, whether they be drop downs or radio buttons or whatever, and do something with it. So of course you're going to want to have access to those. So Making it an inner class allows you to do that. Right? Questions about this method? Questions about how these two are equivalent? Is that clear to everyone? In both cases, we are making a new C to F. The only difference between the two is here we're giving it a variable name, and here we're not. We're just making it and setting it to the action listener. We don't need to make, give it a variable name because we're never going to do anything to it other than to assign it to the action listener. So we're OK. Now, the last option. is this. This is our second button, btn convert fc. We're adding an action listener, right? And when we add an action listener, what's between the parentheses? It has to be an action listener, right? In the first example, the very first example, we said this, all right? And whereas this was defined as implementing the action listener. So we were OK with that. In this example, we said new C to F. And that's fine too, because C to F is an action listener, so we can set that. And then this is just a variation of this. Now, this method, punctuation is critical, all right? Because everything between there and there is the action listener that we're defining. Everything between there and there is the argument to add action listener. All right? This is called an anonymous class, right? We don't give that class even a name. Why don't we care about it? Give it a name because we don't care about it once we set it to be the listener for this. We're never going to do anything else to this other than define the method and set it as a listener to the button.
at least this poor one, we defined the class and gave it a name, right? In the first version, we didn't define the, uh, a name for the object, but at least we defined the class. Now let's look at this syntax. All right. New action listener. All right, we're saying we want to make a new action listener. Well, what do we have to define for an active action listener? We have to define a action performed event. So it's almost like we're putting in this class definition right here after the new. Well, it's not almost like it. It, it is that. All right? We put the definition because what we define here is actually the guts of this new class that we're creating, this anonymous class. We're saying it's an action listener, and here is the action perform method associated with it. All right? So after the parentheses, there's the start bracket. It indicates the start of the class. This might actually make it a little clearer. That indicates the start of our new anonymous class, which is a action listener. So our class goes from here to here. What does our class contain? Well, it's like any other class. It needs to contain any other class that implements action listener. It needs to contain the action performed method. All right. Now, what does the action perform method do here? Well, it tries to do the same thing, except taking it as Fahrenheit and doing it as centigrade, and it fails miserably because this formula is wrong. I think that's the right formula. We'll test it in a minute. Two hundred twelve Fahrenheit to centigrade is indeed a hundred degrees. 32 degrees Fahrenheit is zero degrees. So yay, we're working now. Oh, what was I thinking that day? I don't know. I think that's the day I had a substitute teacher. I must have been. Now, again, these we saw three methods, and one of the methods has sort of a variation on it. All right, but we saw three methods of how to create a listener. All right? One is to simply have the frame also serve in the role as a listener. The second is to create an inner class and set that inner class to, or set an instance of that inner class to the action listener. And the third is by creating this anonymous class. Now, doesn't matter how we do it, between this parenthesis and that parenthesis, it needs to be a class, or I'm sorry, an object that implements the action listener. All right? So however we do it, we have to supply it. And we can supply it any number of ways. Now, I would never code it like this, where I did one button one way, one button the other way. All right, I would be consistent. All right, the good news is that while it's important, I think, to understand the three different ways, you can do the way that it is most makes most sense to you and is most comfortable for, uh, to you. For example, this code I think is a mess to try to read. All right, I don't like code in that style. I would rather create a little class down here and simply go and set it and have the details of the class down there. There are some programmers, though, that are of the school that every keystroke is, is 
precious and is, are so taxing <laughs> that we can save a little bit of time by doing this. And, uh, doing this. And if you're one of those people, not to mention any names, but if you're one of those people, uh, by all means do it that way. Do it the way that makes sense for you and is the most clear. All right. I would suggest that I probably would not do this one with the first first method where I made the frame also the action listener because then I'd have to have my listener decide which button got pressed and I don't want to do that. All right. I would rather... Um, I would rather um, have separate objects. But I would probably do them both as anonymous or both of them as inner classes. Questions about this? Now this is important because again, what this does is this wires your GUI to the code that's going to handle the user interaction to it. Now, one thing I do here I have a extra step involved. And that is my panel which if you remember right, my panel before was just like, boom, there it is. First field, the, the, the text box, the button, the label. Here I'm adding a border layout. And what is a border layout? A border layout allows you to split your screen into sections like a compass. Well, let, let, me, let me pull up an example. All right. In a, in, a, in a border layout, it's like the, the um, directions on a compass. You have north, west, center, east, and south. And you can put different things in the different sections of it. Now, we could go crazy with this and you could actually have within other sections, for example, within the center, you could use one of the other kinds of layouts. All right? Because there's more than one kinds of layouts. Well, I could actually put another border layout inside the center. This is sort of like nesting tags in HTML. Within one table cell, you could have a whole other table. All right? Now what I did in this case is I put something I put label temp in the north section and her temperatures up there I put my text temp in the center. It takes up a big area there. And then finally I put border layout in the east. So that's where the button is there. Yep. I mean it still exists in the real world, you know, but it doesn't exist in your layout, so there's nothing there. Um, probably. I don't know off the top of my head, probably is. Or you have other layouts to use. 
For example, alternatively, this is a code I had commented out that I thought was the button handler. Alternatively, we have this layout, which is a box layout along the x uh, along the y axis. All right. Let me save that and compile it. Boom, boom, boom. It's now oriented vertically. By default, it gives you a box layout on the x-axis, horizontally. By doing this, we can put the, um, make, make it oriented vertically. That is a good question why that is so gigantic in both cases. If that four has anything to do with it. I guess it doesn't. My guess would be that I've given it a certain size and that's the one that it thinks it can resize for some reason. Let's make it smaller. Let's make it 150. All right, there we go. And that makes it smaller. Right? So, this is where I will grudgingly say that if you're doing intricate layouts, you probably would be using an IDE, right? Because you would probably want to get a visual look of it instead of doing all this kind of stuff. Yeah, I guess, all right? But it's important to understand how the IDE does its thing, all right? And everything on your page is simply an object. Right? It's object oriented. Each text box is an object, each button is an object, and so on. And again, in the other language, you have the same thing, right? It's just that the IDE shields a lot of that stuff from you. All right? When you drag something over, you don't see that the instructions that goes and creates the object or associates the event or whatever is, is done with you. That happens sort of behind the scenes. Whereas in this class, part of my goal, I think, is to teach us sort of the nuts and bolts. And this would apply not just to um, Java programming, but also apply um, in other contexts as well. All right, I'm going to upload this example because it's corrected. Um, the math in the Fahrenheit is corrected. Um, so I, I, I can't leave a bad code out there. Yeah, exactly. Um, Wednesday is going to be a work day. All right, so Wednesday we will go directly to lab. Go to lab, go directly to lab. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. All right. Um, so we're going we're gonna to be in lab on, on Wednesday. I have graded what? I've graded everything up to the last lab. The last lab I still haven't graded yet, and I would hope to have that done within um, the next few days. All right, questions? Be up in lab.